And today we have Sean O'Hara with us. Sean originates from Honolulu, and he's the director of the University of Iowa Museum of Art, and he's been there since 2010. And about a year later is when he joined the Iowa Arts Council. Before that, he ran the Figgy Art Museum in Davenport, Iowa. He moved to the University of Iowa from the University of Cambridge, where he was an official fellow of St. Catharines College. O'Hara has taught the history of art at various universities in both the UK, and he received his AB from Harvard and his PhD from Cambridge. Both were in the history of art. His specific area of academic research is in rate perpendicular. And in order to learn about the real world, O'Hara spent several years as an executive in hedge funds, hedge funds, sorry, we talked about finance in the car today, <laughs> and then about technology finance in London. So he has a wonderful story. We hope you enjoy the lecture today. Please silence your cell phones and help me welcome Sean O'Hara with the Hawkeye Lunch and Thank you, so thank much. you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you for um, taking some time out of your, your day. Um, as, uh, as Erica said, I'm, I'm originally from Honolulu. I mean, my family's from Chicago, but uh, originally from Honolulu. And uh, so I'm probably the only guy in the room to think that Iowa is an exotic place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where, where can you find, you know, one day it's 105 degrees, and then maybe a month later it's negative 105 <laughs> degrees. So variety is the spice of life, as they say. I, I'm going to talk about um, Iowa's most famous painting, Pollock's mural. I'm sure a lot of you had seen it when it was at the Des Moines Art Center. And uh, we're going to talk about a remarkable two years in the life of this painting, uh, which um, goes up to this point now. Uh, but of course, it's important to understand what preceded these two years. And so uh, I have a, a, a series of slides and information in a video. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of content, but I'm going to power my way through it because I think it's important to, to tell you all about the story. Um, so of course, Pollock's mural was painted in 1943. And what I often get, and I, and I get this question a lot, wherever I am, is, um, and here it is at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the Getty opening, so you know what it looks like. The question I often get is, why Iowa? Like, why is it in Iowa, right? What is the connection? And actually, there is a very specific reason why it's in Iowa. And there's a very specific reason why it is important to the cultural heritage of Iowa and what was going on in Iowa at the time the painting was uh, acquired in the 1940s, early 1950s. So first of all, what I need to do is I need to explain the history of the Iowa art program, because this is the prelude to the acquisition of the painting. Very briefly, in 1882, undergraduates were required to do freehand drawing in order to graduate. Of course, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, visual and the ability, a visual analysis and the ability to, to draw and create was important for scientists as well as it was for artists. And so this was a requirement for the University of Iowa. By 1900, the first art history classes were introduced. Uh, this is uh, probably from about 1915, 1910. Um, in 1905, Charles Cumming, who was running an art school in Des Moines, which eventually became the Des Moines Art Center, uh, and was the most famous painter in Iowa, was hired as a professor of art at the University of Iowa. And this is actually quite a important event because to hire a professional artist, someone without the qu academic qualifications that a professor would normally have, and someone who would get his hands dirty, um, was actually quite a, a step for the university and perhaps the first such step in the United States. Uh, this actually was in line with the thinking at Iowa. And as you can see, after they developed the um, degree four-year BA in uh, painting in the Department of Graphic and Plastic Arts. By 1922, they decided that art is equivalent to other forms of expression and communication, such as writing. And we were the first university, as a result, to grant a graduate degree in art 
1924, Eve Drulo, who was the first person in the program, received her MA in Fine Arts in Painting. So that's a picture of her as a young lady, and then there's a picture of her exactly 50 years after she started the program in Boulder, Colorado, where she was anointed the most famous artist in Boulder. Um, in 1934, uh, the program hired Grant Wood as professor. <coughs> and again, Grant Wood was the most famous artist in Iowa. He had no formal qualifications. He st studied a bit at the Art Institute of Chicago in metalwork. He went to France and studied painting at the Camille Julien. But he didn't really uh, graduate from any program, and he was hired uh, at a salary that was much higher than other professors. So, of course, you can see where the friction uh, started. And by 1936, uh, Lester Longman came from Princeton. He was an art historian. He also had an MFA. And he came in to run the department. And um, let's just say that the two men had opposing views on, on the world. <laughs> um, and I'll explain a little about this. Uh, Grant Wood was trained in the European um, method. And he believed in the apprentice system where a, an artist would uh, train with a, a master artist and uh, learn to paint like that artist. So there was very much a sort of an apprentice system that you would see in Europe. Uh, Lester Longman came in to transform the program. And really what he wanted to do was he wanted to have a program that, that emphasized creation of art from nothing. To to instead of copying, to have 100% creativity. So Grant Wood was a proponent of the regionalist style, um, but Lester Longman was a modernist. He wanted to create the new art for America, and as far as he was concerned, that was going to be abstract art, abstract expressionism. Um, so a lot of the debate that occurred in the United States between um, the various schools of, of thought uh, on art and the direction that art will take in America and in the world, particularly after World War II, occurred in Iowa City. And you will see a bit later what I mean by that. And by 1938, um, Lester Longman had succeeded in creating the new BFA, MFA, PhD programs at Iowa. These were the first such programs in the United States, particularly the MFA and BFA, which was a professional artist degree. And by 1940, Elizabeth Catlett, who was a woman, an African American, graduated from the f with the first MFA degree granted to a student. And this is a first in the country. And again, it shows the type of program that we ran in, 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 in Iowa. Um, you have her graduation photo. I'm not sure if this is Howard University where she did undergraduate or, or University of Iowa when she did her uh, MFA. But then next to it is probably her most famous print, Sharecropper, uh, which we have a great example at the uh, University Museum. Uh, Elizabeth Catlett was Grant Wood's star student. Grant Wood said that he would uh, uh, do anything to get her graduated. And it was a bit of an issue because she had taken an engineering course at Iowa State because she was studying sculpture. And she wanted to learn about um, um, materials that way. And the University of Iowa found that uh, difficult to accept. <laughs> maybe, not because it was Iowa State, or maybe it was because of Iowa State. But anyway, but, and so they, had a, they, they, they delayed her degree, but Grant Wood fought it for, uh, uh, for a while. And she finally was granted. And so she was the first student to receive that MFA degree. OK, so I mentioned that both Grant Wood and Lester Longman um, had opposing views. Now, Lester Longman came from uh, Princeton. He came from New York. I think he was originally from Ohio. But he um, had a lot of connections in, in, in New York. And so he was wanting to develop the program in, uh, as I said, uh, more towards abstract art. Uh, Grant Wood, and there's a portrait of Grant Wood uh, next to his uh, painting uh, of the schoolhouse that's on our quarter. Grant Wood ran the WPA program uh, for Iowa out of the mural studio, they called it, in uh, the University of Iowa. And by, um, by 1941, Grant Wood is very sick. And in 1942, he dies of pancreatic cancer. Um, 
Lesser Longman is busy developing the program another way, and this gives Lesser Longman a, a, an opportunity to have a free hand at, at hiring new professors who would espouse his view. Um, just, just a side note, between 1946, just to show you how important the program was, between 1946 and 1962, the University of Iowa granted more art degrees than any other university in the United States. So we were a big deal. Uh, 1941, just as Grant Wood leaves, Philip Guston was appointed at Iowa as professor. as a, a later sort of photographic portrait of, of, of Philip Guston next to one of his paintings. Uh, he was more of a regional surrealist when he was here, and he developed into uh, what they consider to be one of the fathers of abstract painting. Uh, Philip Guston continued when he went back to New York after several years at Iowa to send students to the University of Iowa. The program was so important in the country that Peggy Guggenheim, who was the, the most significant gallery and dealer and art patron in the United States at the time, uh, recognized the University of Iowa as, as such and, and decided to donate a, a, a portion of her collection, uh, including Mural. And this happened in 1948, um, although it took a little while for Mural to arrive because it was so big. And the university argued over the $40 shipping fee. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a long story, but you can imagine. You can imagine. The painting was free, but the shipping was $40. So <laughs> a bit of an issue there. Um, so it took them three years to get it. Uh, and uh, Peggy Guggenheim uh, was so ahead of the game, so important, that she was not that successful in the United States. And she ended up moving to Venice. Uh, there's a picture of her in Venice. Uh, with her signature dogs and her signature glasses, and you can buy those glasses at the museum there uh, <laughs> in Venice. And um, I've been told a number of stories by professors from the University of Iowa who had to visit, pay homage to Peggy, and went out and sat in her gondola. And of course, she really did sort of dress like that, and, and, and her dogs really did act like that. So, um, so Peggy Guggenheim thought the program was important. Uh, the program was. Uh, uh, the, similar to that at Yale, Yale, were the, Yale and Iowa were the two major art programs going on at the time, and so the collection was split between the two universities. Um, so the mural arrives at the University of Iowa. Um, by 1959, Frank Cyberling is hired as director of the School of Art and Art History. Um, and what he does is he continues the program that Lester Longman um, uh, started, which was uh, you know, in the Midwest, there, there were events uh, called Chautauquas, and they were really uh, roaming uh, intellectual presentations that um, stimulated debate and educated the local population. Uh, Lester Longman decided to bring art exhibitions from MoMA or the Met um, here to, the United, to, to Iowa City, and these became quite famous. In fact, so famous that the um, some universities and museums in California would call Lester Longman to ask him if he could send on the shows because they're already <laughs> halfway across the country <laughs> and they were very excited uh, to see new art. Uh, it, was, it was reported in some of the New York papers, for example, that uh, the University of Iowa, when they had these shows here in Iowa City, would then um, acquire a, a number of the works of art. And so they listed people like Picasso and Miro and so on. And of course, a lot of this art being very new was not very expensive. And the University of Iowa, of course, you know, isn't the richest university in the world. So they were able to get a lot of these pieces for quite not much money at all, if I can put it that way. And, and so they built the collection starting in the 1940s. And so this explains why the collection is so important today and why they're able to actually acquire such a collection. Uh, and by 1968, 1969, uh, Owen and Leon Elliott from Cedar Rapids gifted uh, uh, a few hundred paintings and works of art to the university uh, with the stipulation that they create a museum of art for the students. And, and that was a good thing. The art was able to leave other parts of campus and move into a central location. Uh, I just want to give you a quick uh, view of the studio in, 19, in the mid-1950s, and so you can see um, Pollock's mural up there in the corner. Then you can see it in the, in the, in the museum uh, after 1960, 1972-73. Um, I, I actually spoke to the man who was in that picture. I believe this was the man I spoke to. And I said, so what did you think of this painting coming in? Because if you look at the, the picture, none of them are painting like Pollock, right? They're painting like Grant Wood, actually. And yet there's this Pollock painting. And so I asked him, I said, so why, 
so what did it mean to the students? And they said, oh, he said, you know, it, we didn't, we didn't want to paint like Grant Wood. No one wanted to paint like Grant Wood. I mean, by, by, like, by, by Jackson, like Jackson Pollock. But we all wanted to be Jackson Pollock. <laughs> so that was the key. That was the key. That Jackson Pollock lived as an artist. And, and so they wanted to live as professional artists. And so he was, he was their model. Now, I'm just going to quickly fast forward ahead. 2008, there was a, a small flood in Iowa City. <laughs> And uh, there's the iconic photograph from the newspapers. Um, it obliterates the museum effectively, obliterates a lot, large part of the arts campus. Um, and the insurers at the university um, who insure the collection, and of course, you know, there are only two or three major insurers that can do this, basically said, putting all this art on a floodplain is a really stupid idea. <laughs> Go figure. So, at any rate, that forced us, and after a few unsuccessful appeals, it forced us to have to rethink uh, our approach. The, in the meantime, the museum uh, collection, a lot of it was moved to the uh, Figgy Art Museum in Davenport. And you can see a sort of panoramic shot of the collection of the university there. And then in the Union, they were able to create a, a gallery for students. Um, and we were able to put about 3,000 works of art in that gallery space in the uh, Iowa Moral Union on the third floor. So we have rotating exhibitions there. Um, but it also, it forced us to think outside of the box. And we decided to, like we moved Pollock's painting, we decided to move the collection around the state. And, and the Des Moines Art Center exhibition two years ago was an example. Um, Kay and Matthew Buxbaum very kindly funded this program over the next few years. Uh, you have our education curator uh, at the top. Um, he actually pioneered the program of touring collections in schools and other venues. And so we got that idea, and we thought that we could expand that across the state. So right now, the museum collection is being viewed at several locations any time, at any one time during, during the course of the year. And we now have the Pollock mural in Sioux City. So we are really uh, exhibiting work from Davenport to Sioux City. And this is a new model for museums. And um, you know, we hope that it, maybe it'll be a model to be adopted by the, uh, by the rest of the country. Um, so now we get to the topic, which is Pollock's mural. So you understand how we got it and why it was important. Um, and as part of the fact that we don't have a museum and that we have to rotate the works around, we thought we would take advantage of that and conserve and stabilize Pollock's mural. This, was, this has been a major project that's been on the cards for a very, very long time. Um, but uh, because I have a budget of zero to do it, uh, I had very limited options. And the Getty uh, very kindly offered gratis to treat the painting and to uh, work on it if they were able to do research, which of course is fantastic because that's what we're here for. And the Pollock um, um, being promoted by the Getty is about as good as it's going to get. So I will um, go into that. The Getty has its own campus. It actually has two locations, uh, one near Malibu, um, and, and the latest location is here. Um, uh, that's the, one of the entrances to, to the Getty in California. It's sort of uh, an oasis uh, overlooking uh, Los Angeles. And if you, if you know Los Angeles, you'll understand why they need oases. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, a group of buildings. And the Getty actually are, is actually multiple institutions. And I'll explain a little about that. Um, there's Pollock's mural at the Getty as it arrived. This is the first photograph before the conservation. And just to give you a brief out, you know, outline of the timeline, uh, it was in Des Moines f for the spring and part of the summer in 2012. Uh, about 35,000 visitors viewed it. It was the most popular show in, 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 our, in our history in Iowa. Uh, it then moved to the Getty uh, as it moved across the, the country. And uh, over 300,000 people viewed it from um, March uh, to June. Uh, there was a conservation project. Uh, there were various conferences, and I'll go into more, more into that later. And now it's in Sioux City. So that gives you the, the, the view of the two-year timeline. This is how it's transported from Davenport to Des Moines. Um, you can see it's a really big painting. 
And, um, and so it, logistically, it's actually quite complicated. Um, this is a picture of the wing uh, in Des Moines. I wanted to show you that because uh, the architect, Richard Meyer, also designed the Getty. So there's that connection. And um, the Getty has uh, uh, the largest endowment of any museum in the world. It is uh, uh, a $6.2 billion organization. It is dedicated only to the study of art. That's all it does. Um, if it were a university, it would be the 15th largest university in the United States. It, it is the Getty Trust, which uh, oversees the operations. Um, the Getty Museum, which is the museum side, the fine arts side. The Getty Conservation Institute, which is the, these are the scientists that do work on conservation of art. And the Getty Research Institute, which has a library and a lot of resources and sponsors a lot of research programs. The Getty specializes in art before the 20th century. Again, I'm, I'm saying this because it's, it's relevant to this project. Uh, so they are very famous for um, classical sculpture, uh, medieval manuscripts, um, paintings by Van Gogh and Rembrandt. Um, so they're very much a tra traditional art museum in, in, in many respects. Um, the new strategy, of course, is that the 20th century is here to stay, and they are very uh, interested in doing more and more projects that involve the 20th century, um, particularly in other areas of the Getty uh, outside the museum, like the Getty Conservation Institute. And so the Pollock Mural Project fit in very, very well uh, because it is considered uh, one of the most significant modern artworks in, in America. Um, we worked with the Getty Conservation Department, the department at the uh, Getty Museum. Um, they assessed the work. They cl clean the surface. They remove the varnish uh, with a Q-tip over two years, so it's a big deal. Um, they uh, built a new stretcher, as I'll show you a bit later. Uh, they wanted to stabilize the paint surface, and they worked on a very important book collaboration. Uh, again, they have a marvelous publication department, and so they put experts together, and they came out with a very uh, a, a, a wonderful book. Uh, the Getty uh, Museum Paintings Department uh, collaborated with us. They were part of the initial discussion, and they worked on the exhibition that then was presented uh, from March to June uh, this year at the Getty Museum. The Getty Conservation Institute, again, they were part of the conservation discussion. These are the scientists, and they have an area called the Modern Paints Project. Um, they uh, worked on the science of the painting, one of the devices that they used, a spectrometer that they worked on, was on the Mars rover. Okay, so that's sort of the level of science that they're, they're working with. And they were able to put together a lot of other material, and they worked on the book um, and the subsequent conference. And again, I'll show you a little piece after this uh, uh, showing what they've done. Uh, the Getty Research Institute organized a symposium that was held uh, earlier this year. And they are also producing a book on research uh, papers related to the topic, uh, as well as um, putting material online. So again, it's a, it's a, a, a powerful grouping. That's just someone um, <laughs> who happens to be in the Conservation Institute, uh, sorry, the Conservation Department of the museum. This is the sort of art that, that the Getty traditionally uh, conserves. Um, uh, that's uh, a portrait by Raphael. Uh, in the c and, and conservation departments are the best places to see art because you see them uh, uh, from all sides, from all angles, and there's a certain amount of natural light, so it's a wonderful place to see, see paintings. Um, that's mural as it arrived with a bit of uh, sunlight to see parts of the surface. Um, that's just as the sun is setting uh, on the painting. Um, that gives you an idea of what the varnish was like because there was of course, varnish applied in 1972, 73, which um, Pollock never varnished his painting, so that was an issue. Um, that's the back of the painting. Show the old stretcher. That's just, I don't know, Rembrandt or something. That's just another painting on the <laughs> side. Um, these are the two conservators that did a lot of the work, Yvonne Safran and Laura Rivers, and we can't thank them enough for their expertise and their hard work over two years. Um, uh, this is the new stretcher that was built. There's someone's just explaining how the, the cleat system works. They built a new stretcher out of Alaskan cedar. Uh, it is a work of art in itself. Um, 
And, and this is not the painting cut up into pieces. It's actually uh, uh, the installation uh, at the Getty. I just thought it was kind of a funny shot because you know it's part of the painting. Um, it could be like the missing part of the <laughs> Pollock painting. And um, that's the uh, exhibition going up. So just to give you an idea of how these things work. And they were sort of adjusting the, the height of the painting because that's always an issue uh, given the crowds that come through. Um, that's the other uh, room which housed really just didactic. So you just had a, an exhibition that just had one painting and a bunch of, you know, didactics on conservation science, right? So, you know, it's amazing uh, uh, what came out of that. Uh, this is the opening. This is actually the press conference. Um, again, it's good to have uh, the Getty as a partner because at the press conference, there were 31 news outlets that were at the press conference. Um, I don't think I could name 31 newspapers, so that was, that was pretty good. Again, this is, uh, uh, this is actually the opening, and this is actually a picture of folks from Iowa who were there at the opening um, on in, in, in early March. And this is Yvonne Safran explaining one of the didactics. Um, here's the painting, again, before the conservation and after the conservation, right? So you can see before and after, and you can kind of see how things are brighter. Obviously, the lighting is different, but the, uh, the colors are bright. There are colors we've never seen before because the varnish muted the surface. Um, here's the book, just because I was in the bookstore and I couldn't believe that the book was already out um, uh, next to a book on uh, Queen Victoria. Um, and the mural show at the Getty uh, was their record show. It got 304,000 people. The average weekly attendance was 25,300 people. Uh, and uh, what was important for the Getty was that a vast majority, 84% of the people who go to the Getty, went to the Getty, actually visited the show, uh, which, is a, which is an important number because the Getty has famous gardens and, and actually uh, a majority of the people often do not go into the, into the museum. So this, this was a draw for them. And so this was important because it demonstrates how important our collection is and the fact that people around the world want to see it. And so this is, again, important for Iowa and for what we offer and what we do at a, as a university and as a state. Um, uh, now I'm going to play a quick video uh, that just came out um, last week. So you're, you're the first people here probably to see it. So I'm going to play this quick video. Jasmine Pollock represents a huge shift in painting. When Peggy Guggenheim commissioned him to paint this, Pollock was a very young artist and not particularly well known. This is the painting really that gave him a name. It's a landmark work in that he is shifting in, in his ideas of how to apply the paint, uh, what kind of paint to use. It's one of the earliest all over uh, compositions. You know, I think it was exciting for everybody to see this shift in, away from figurative painting towards the abstract. There's a whole suite of instrumentation being evolved now looking at imaging, uh, an entire work of art. So it's great when you take a tiny microscopic sample of paint. You know, we can tell so much about what's in that tiny, tiny sample. But really, that could be a unique case. You know, a bit of paint one inch away from that could be completely different. So when you tie in the point analysis, detecting certain pigments or binders, with these new techniques where you can look across the entire surface of the painting and target certain materials, um, we can tell, for example, with mural, we can target the different blue pigments. We can see exactly which blue was put where across the entire surface with hyperspectral imaging, one of the techniques we use, as well as this fantastic, uh, almost sort of fortuitous instance where a particular material that was present in the casein house paints, uh, we, we couldn't detect the casein by imaging, but this component that was only in the casein house paints, um, it was an aluminum silicate extender. Uh, that material we could uh, um, we could image across the whole surface, so we have a great image where we can see exactly where this house paint was used compared to the oil. There are many stories from Peggy, who, who wrote several autobiographies, as well as Lee Krasner, who related stories to friends and colleagues, that once Pollock got the canvas stretched, he had this immense, vast expanse of canvas and didn't know what to paint. And so he had, you know, artists, painter's block, if you will, didn't know what to paint. And then uh, inspiration struck him one night and he painted the entire painting in a very short 
24 hour, 36 hour period. But we were able to look more closely, of course, at the layers of paint and really show that, in fact, that that couldn't have been possible. Our colleagues who had already disproved that slide made it very clear that when you look at the number of oil paint layers on this painting, and oil paint takes days, if not weeks, to dry, and you can see very clearly that a lot of the oil paints have been applied over existing dried layers that this wasn't possible. But we did make a discovery, we think, where we actually added some truth back to that myth, which was there were four paints, uh, the first four paints that went down. There's a bright yellow, there's a red, a brown, and a, a, a dark sort of bluey green, a teal color, um, which were all applied very dilute. Uh, they were all mixed wet and wet. You can see very clearly in cross sections these, 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 these layers blended to, together. And they're across the entire surface, so we're fairly confident that there was this initial campaign, or probably entirely conceivably done in one night. There's a whole range of ways that Pollock was throwing paint at the canvas. Um, a lot of it is brushed on. You can see where the brush strokes are. The brush would have touched the canvas. Um, but he's trying to kind of separate brush and canvas. Um, and even though we look very closely at a lot of the paint in this painting, um, which we thought might have been applied with the painting flat on the studio floor as, as came later, we think that the painting was actually executed entirely vertically, leant up against his studio wall, but with different sort of ways of applying the paint, splatter, some paint is dilute, drips down the surface, other paint flies through the, through, through, through the air, lands on the canvas and stays very much in, intact. In conservation, there are often no completely right and completely wrong answers. It's always a sort of a judgment. We make a decision. We weigh up certain things. And we wanted to kind of let the public into some of those thought processes, um, in particular about the shape of the canvas. So the stretcher was made here in-house. Uh, we're very lucky here at the Getty and that we have professional carpenters. They worked with us to come up with a design that involves Alaskan cedar, which is a very light but very strong straight-grained straight wood, as well as using a very light but solid support that is, is two layers of very light, thin aluminum with polyethylene in between, so that we were able to provide in the sort of open spaces of the structure, we were able to put um, a solid material that you're not aware of from the front, so that there's no flapping, let's say, around of the canvas itself as it travels. The most rewarding part of this project, undoubtedly, was uh, the painting was installed, the gallery was looking great, and then we had a group of about 50 VIPs from Iowa who came um, all the way from Iowa to the opening. They were dressed up, this was a big occasion for them, and they all just went silent and they started applauding. Now, they've known this painting for 30 or 40 years, they've lived with it. Um, they know it's important, it's, it's, it's relevant, they're deeply proud that Iowa has this painting. And to have that sort of reaction from them, um, just the appreciation that we've clearly done something right. Right, so I thought that was a, a good ending, uh, talking about Iowa. And uh, so having the Getty was a wonderful partner. They are obviously uh, located uh, basically in Hollywood, so they're very good at making films. And so we're very grateful for, for all of their help and their um, uh, material. Um, so let me just quickly uh, go through uh, what I see are some of the benefits uh, of the project. Um, you know, first of all, you know, having the Getty as a partner, as I mentioned, brings a lot of resources in that we would never have had. I mean, they spent millions of dollars on this project. Uh, I had zero, so um, that's a big difference. Um, it also uh, uh, links us with other uh, funders of the project. The Mellon and Guggenheim Foundations were participating in the project. Uh, again, um, these are organizations that are, are speaking to us because of this project. Um, uh, the other thing is that it brings, uh, it raises Iowa's profile in the world. Um, you know, Iowa does not have uh, the best reputation in terms of culture in the United States. And uh, even though I think that's entirely unfair, um, I'm probably linked to the fact that we're, um, you know, uh, Midwesterners who don't want to promote ourselves very much. Um, the fact is that we do have wonderful resources and people should come here and we do have something to share. So this project, of course, is important because it tells the world that Iowa actually has something to offer. Um, uh, other benefits is that uh, the Getty will be a partner um, 
forever. Uh, they've offered to um, <clears throat> uh, work with us on the painting, um, advise us on the new museum that we're uh, uh, going through the process of, of, of building. Um, and so, of course, having uh, uh, very, very important people in the field, uh, again, um, has proven helpful. Um, Iowans benefit because of co uh, from this type of collaboration because, of course, it, it promotes the state, it brings new resources, it diversifies our state institutions. Uh, museums are important for the ecosystem of a civilization. And so, therefore, to have uh, important works of art uh, as part of the public education, I have to stress public education, because the, edu the, the collection at the University of Iowa is not for the art students only. And that's the biggest mistake people make. They think, oh, art collection, art students. Really, it's for everyone in the state of Iowa. Obviously, there are advantages being a student at the University of Iowa and why you would go to the University of Iowa, uh, because you have a unique experience uh, that is world class in Iowa City. But it also means that the rest of the state benefits. And so, again, this is why um, these sort of projects are important. Um, here is a view of the m painting in Sioux City. Uh, I mentioned to some people they did a wonderful job in presenting this painting. Um, and it is only a five hour drive or four and a half hour drive from here. Um, you know, just go straight down I 80 and take a right. And, uh, and so it's, it's worth seeing, and you'll see also part of the Getty exhibition, which is mounted on the other side. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of things about the museum, just because I'm sure I'll get some questions on this. Um, uh, of course, there was a flood, and we were uh, evicted from our building, and so we're sort of homeless, but we're kind of all over the place now. And uh, between 2015 and 2018, we're going to go through the throes of building a new facility. But in the meantime, in that period, we're going to use that to tell the world that they should pay attention to Iowa. We will do a show that involves Pollock's mural and other American paintings to talk about how these paintings influenced the world of art and the development of art over the, over the successive decades since it was painted and to also promote the University of Iowa and the state of Iowa uh, in the cultural community around the world. So we're talking um, large parts of Europe and uh, possibly it'll come back to um, Washington DC or one of the cities in the United States before it returns back to Iowa City where a new museum building will be waiting for it because wouldn't it be a shame if the whole world celebrated our collection and it had nothing to go to when it came back, uh, which I don't think will be the case. Um, so that's the end of my talk, um, but as a postscript, I'd like to show you something, a new discovery that they uh, made at the Getty. Um, they were marching the painting, and of course there are a lot of rumors about <coughs> the, uh, what's underneath the paint. And some people suggested it was Jackson Pollock's name, some people say, suggested other things. Um, but it turns out, of course, that Jackson Pollock's parents were from Iowa. They were from Tingley, Iowa. They both graduated from Tingley High School. So he is 100% genetically Iowan. <laughs> but but as, as, as good Iowa parents, uh, they left the state and they raised him uh, in Los Angeles. Um, but because of that, when they took the, the, the varnish off, they realized that actually it didn't say his name. It actually <laughs> said something else. And I don't know if you can see it, but I, I think it refers to Iowa. So. <laughs> On that note, um, I'm, I'm ready to take questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes? In the mural, it seems to me that there are some faces in the crowd. Yes. I'm just wondering if those are Hawkeye fans. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Um, but uh, as you can tell, they've had a little drink. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, in the back. Yeah. I presume the varnishing. It was. They, they, they varnished the surface and they lined it in wax to stabilize the painting because the painting was rolled up and unrolled and you have to realize that oil paintings, um, and this was a traditional oil painting, that, that was the thing that shocked everyone was we figured it would be, you know, 20 feet of house paint, which would be, you know, a horror, but actually it turned out that it was the most traditional oil painting, uh, mind you, okay, done in 1943 with the highest quality you know, Italian style oil paints with not a lot of filler. 
lined Belgian canvas of the highest quality, 1943. And we think that Peggy Guggenheim really told Pollock, you're going to do this right. We're going to buy you the best materials. So because of that, the painting could be rolled like any traditional oil painting was in the past. And so in order to stabilize it, they figured they would make it rigid. So they lined it and they got the best person from the RSU Chicago, um, Lou Pomerantz, who was the most uh, important uh, modern conservator at the time. And the thinking was that you would stabilize it by putting wax at the back, making it stiff, and then putting a varnish to protect it. So to some extent it protected it, but now the conservation science doesn't believe that should be done. And so they had to basically undo it, although they kept the wax lining because they thought, well, you know, actually it's stable. It's, it's kept the painting from moving, uh, you know, because the, paint, the painting is so big, it's like a sail. Uh, so, so really, it keeps it from flexing. They put a new stretcher, uh, as you saw, so it's very, very rigid. And although it does have some movement in it, because you know paintings do move over time, so you don't really want to make it too stiff, otherwise it'll start to crack. Um, and then they took the varnish off. So, um, so that's that's the kind of the, the story behind that. But I, I get the impression that conservators do a lot of their work undoing what conservators may say in previous generations have done. So um, that's just my impression. Um, yes? When it goes to Europe, will it be taken off of that stretcher? No, no. It'll stay on that stretcher. It'll go, the, the, the Getty very kindly constructed a travel frame, and they got their carpenters, who are just the best carpenters in the world, to, to make a special um, uh, crate for it. And so it is the, uh, the best type of material, um, new types of plastics, uh, as well as um, um, approved woods. Because um, when you travel internationally, there are conventions on the types of woods that can travel um, so that you don't, you don't carry bugs around and that sort of thing. And so they were able to use very special woods that allow us to then travel internationally. Um, and then they're going to visit uh, or they say they could uh, visit the uh, venues just to double check on the painting and make sure that it's, 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 everything's right. So it's a, it's a full service uh, relationship. And where all is it going? Uh, well, we, um, um, it, it hasn't totally been confirmed, but we're, we're hoping that it will go to Italy and then Germany and then uh, Great Britain um, and then it will come back to the United States. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a two-year schedule and that's actually, um, you know, a good amount of time for a painting to travel. Uh, and so we're kind of um, hoping that uh, that'll be enough time to build a new museum. Uh, yes, in the back, yeah. What was the link to the video that you included in your presentation? Um, that's, if you go onto YouTube and just do Getty Pollock, you'll find that, you'll find that video. And, they, and it literally just came out like just a few days ago. Um, yes? I was wondering where the uh, new museum would be located and do you have an architect already? Um, uh, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but what we're doing right now is we're interviewing developers. Uh, and the developers, uh, as part of their proposal, will uh, offer a piece of land. So uh, there are a, a number of choices. Uh, but what, one thing I can say is that the location of the art museum needs to be accessible to the entire campus and not just the art students. So where, where it was before, which was a beautiful spot on the side of the river, unfortunately it was on the side of the river, but it was, it was off to one side and it was really uh, built uh, so that it was e easy access for the art students. But really what the art museum is about is education for everyone. And particularly with the obliteration, I mean the, 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 the purge of art education in our, in, our, uh, you know, in our high schools and our lower schools, um, it makes it all more important for our students to have access to this type of art during their, during their years at the university. Um, yes, you were going to ask something. How yeah. long is the painting going to be at Sioux City? Um, it'll be at Sioux City until April 2015. So you have a, a very long time, and uh, so you can't blame the weather. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Where was the painting physically painted? It was physically painted in his studio in New York, uh, in Manhattan, um, and then he had to bust a wall down. Uh, to get it out. Um, build a sail sailboat in your garage. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And then it got uh, put into Peggy Guggenheim's apartment uh, where she had the opening. 
And uh, w there was a famous picture of her, uh, again with her two dogs, standing next to Jackson Pollock uh, with the painting behind. That's in her, in her, um, uh, in her foyer. And, and what's important is that the, it was only 13 feet wide. So uh, one of the challenges for the museum uh, to present the painting is the original painting was meant to be in a very confined space. And the revolutionary idea behind the painting was as you walked into the space, you walked into the painting. I mean, you, it, was, it was like an experience, like a hall of mirrors of sorts. And, and it wasn't the sort of painting you would hang over your fireplace. So this was, this was a whole new experience. And so the, 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 the challenge is how do you present the painting to an audience, a modern audience, but then allow them to experience it similar to the way Jackson Pollock intended it. And, uh, and so this is why touring it at multiple venues means that the best museums in the world get a crack at presenting it. And then we get to steal their ideas. Or it's called best practice. It's called best practice. But actually, we're going we're gonna to take those ideas and incorporate the new museum. Yes, you have a question back there. Okay, well, the, the, popular, the popular view was that Lester Longman and Peggy Guggenheim really liked each other. But the, uh, what I think what happened was uh, Lester Longman uh, was out of Princeton. He was uh, uh, very close to artists in New York. Uh, really, New York was uh, one of the places that uh, uh, pushed art of many types, uh, particularly during the war. And he was able to recruit people, and, and really, he felt that abstract art was going to be the art movement of America, and that, and that the art world would shift from Europe to, to New York, from Paris to New York. That was his view, and that's something that he wanted to accomplish. Uh, Peggy Guggenheim had the same view that these young American artists would be the future of, of, of the new direction of art. And and so uh, they basically colluded. Uh, he ended up at Iowa, which was the home of the Iowa idea, which was this um, merger of art and art history and using art as a form of communication. Um, Iowa's um, template uh, for this type of education, the Iowa idea, was used as the model for expanding art departments across the United States after the war and across the Commonwealth. So in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the new university art departments were based on the Iowa model. And because of that, Peggy Guggenheim was very, very interested in Iowa. And so her donation of paintings to the University of Iowa was a way of her contributing to this new art program. So Iowa was at the absolute forefront. And, and, and Peggy Guggenheim knew that. And so Lester Longman and Peggy Guggenheim worked together to make that happen. And I don't think very many people know that, that Iowa was at the forefront. And I think it's important that people do know about it because this was the beginning of, of the uh, domination of the world uh, of art by, the, by, by America. Um, so much so that, um, again, this is information that has recently come out, that the US government secretly um, set up foundations in Europe that would fund American art shows as part of the Cold War, and they would promote people like um, Rothko and, 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 and Jackson Pollock. Um, remember, American regionalism was linked to um, uh, the art of communist China, uh, the Soviet Union. It was social realism. It was connected to uh, communists and socialists in Mexico. And so, um, and so uh, in fact, I, I think Lester Longman referred to uh, Grant Wood as a commune Nazi. Uh, not that that, not that, I mean, that was not true, but, but, but the art that he, uh, 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 the art that he pursued was, was, was associated with that. So the abstract idea that in America you could do put anything on a painting and call it a painting. Is it, you know, we are a free country. Essentially, that's why uh, this Pollock was so important and why Peggy Guggenheim uh, and Lester Longman wanted to uh, collaborate. So that's a kind of a long-winded uh, answer to your question. Yeah. Yes? Is there any plans in the new museum to promote what you just got through talking about, the Iowa art? Um, because I've never heard that before. Yes, uh, uh, we do because the, 
the core of the collection, again, the part of the reason why I wanted to tell you the story was that this is a compelling story. It's a story of art in America, but it's also a story of art in Iowa, as you, as you very rightly put it. And, and I think that this museum should explain how, how the debate developed in Iowa and, and how that was important to the rest of the country. Um, and our collection is entirely the result of this debate. Um, the reason why it took many decades for the university to even collect art by Grant Wood, even though he was our most famous professor, um, uh, explains to you why, uh, you know, the, the how, how vicious this debate was. Um, and so now that we're, you know, long past this, we can present it in a much more objective way. And, um, and so, yes, it is important to, to, show, to promote that. Um, I think Philip Gustin is actually an important professor uh, because he uh, started off as a, a, a somewhat regionalist in his way, uh, became sort of a surrealist, and then really, when he went back to New York, became the father of, 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 of one of the major uh, abstract expressionist movements. So um, he embodies that sort of shift and, uh, and so uh, the answer is yes. In the museum, we're going to make sure that where this painting is, we can talk about the contribution that Iowa made to the development of art in the world. Yeah, I won't be offended if you have to go back to work. So. Yes, yes. They were separate panels, right? Is it, is it all one well, piece? Well, it is all one piece, but the several panels was the mock-up um, that was used to, to put it up. So um, that's why I took a, took a picture of that, because I thought that was kind of funny. But no, the, it's one piece of canvas. Amazingly, it's one 20-foot by 8-and-a-half-foot piece of canvas. That's huge. Yeah, that was huge, yeah. yeah. Yes? So I think uh, talking about kind of her connection to Iowa, but if, yeah. you know, if you know the story of her connection to me, you know, why she was choosing Pollock to do that for you. Uh, well, Pollock was in a group of artists that she uh, uh, worked with, and I, I, I think that she and her advisor, because remember she had some very good advisors, um, uh, one of them was Marcel Duchamp. Um, she was very close to Clement Greenberg, who was a great art critic. Uh, and so uh, I think that she was really tipped off that Pollock would be, um, would, would had, 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 in it, had in, in him what it took. But he had never done anything like this before. In fact, it was an amazing gamble if you really think about it, which of course shows how Peggy was such a, uh, uh, such a, uh, a forward-thinking person. But um, he, he had painted uh, in the past a bit like his mentor, um, Thomas Hart Benton. So he did have a, a, a sort of regionalist strain, but he was really exploring and he was very eclectic. And um, basically she, you know, laid down a challenge and said to him, I'm going to pay you $150 a month, which was a lot of money in those days. And in Iowa, it's still a lot of money, actually. And he, 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 and she said, I'm going to pay you this incredible stipend and you're going to present this painting at the opening in November and you're going to shock the world. And so he had to figure this out, which is part of the reason why, two things. What, one, one, why this painting was so well documented before it was painted. I mean, who would take a picture of, a, of an artist in front of a canvas, right? I mean, they were obviously preparing for something. Uh, she bought the best oils and the best materials for him. Um, and, and so, of course, for those months, he was sort of, you know, kind of thinking, well, gee, what am I going to do? But he decided uh, towards the end to go this route to make uh, an experiential painting, uh, one that isn't similar to anything that had preceded it. And it's really the beginning of a lot of aspects. In fact, this is sort of, I call this the sort of the Rosetta Stone of, of techniques by Jackson Pollock. Because in this painting, you see all the techniques that you'll see in the future of Jackson Pollock. You'll see, um, uh, obviously, he has certain painterly aspects, uh, the abstract aspect to it, the fact he's throwing paint at the, at the canvas, again, which is the beginning of Pollock's uh, splash technique. Um, it's the first introduction of house paint. Again, lucky for us, 99% is not house paint. It's the first example of house paint. I feel very sorry for all those people who have Pollock's full of house paint because that's going to be a problem conserving. But this is, you know, a, a very traditional oil painting.
So I think that uh, given all that, and I just think that Peggy was just very, um, you know, was a very intelligent, forward-thinking person. I think she figured things out very quickly. Um, Clement Greenberg, um, you know, looked at the painting and said, Jackson Pollock's the greatest artist that America has produced. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, the rest is history, let me put it that way. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yes, yes. I wonder, does anybody speculate on how he evolved because the evolution from the regionalism to the to this is so amazing to see in the before and after. I wonder what inspired him. Well, you know, actually that's very interesting. And, and uh, uh, one thing I've learned in the project is that uh, what has happened, what was happening in America at the time, and particularly American art in the 1940s, um, Obviously, there was a war going on. There were, there were a lot of refugees coming into, into places like New York. A lot of artists were moving in from Europe and elsewhere. Um, it was an amazing time to, 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 to think about the direction of art. There was this view that art had to go in a certain direction, that it couldn't continue what it was doing. Um, and I think that there was you know, definitely uh, events that occurred you know, when um, the Nazis banned c modern art and wanted to promote social realism, uh, when, when you know, the Soviets um, also pursued uh, similar agendas. So I think that there was this uh, debate. Um, in future presentations uh, of this painting uh, and the art of this period, because we have other pieces obviously from, from, this, from this period, we also thought about presenting music at the same time, and we realized that in 1943, Aaron Copland was, was producing music that was very avant-garde. Um, John Cage was starting his uh, career. Uh, John Cage, incidentally, was trained as a painter. Um, so a lot of these artists and, and, and musicians and performing artists were rethinking art. So I think he was part of a larger movement. But I think that New York in 1943 was a very interesting place to be. Um, given all these uh, happenings. So that's probably the, <laughs> you know, my stab at an answer. Yes, in the back. This has really warmed up my memories of walking across the art bridge when it was 20 below zero. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a warm day <laughs> in Iowa. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and you know, it's very beautiful, right? When it's 20 degrees below zero. <laughs> yeah. Because you're the only person out there, probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, the current uh, um, value is $140 million, but it goes up and down. Uh, you know, one of the problems with uh, um, placing values on paintings is that, you know, it could be the flavor of the month now and not the flavor of the month next year and so on. But it's priceless in terms of its contribution to culture in Iowa and the fact that the whole world looks at Iowa. And, and it's not that we have this painting by accident. We had this painting because of who we are and who we were and the role we played. So this painting is a story, but it, and it's an education. And I think that, uh, you know, for many of you, this is the first time you've heard this. Uh, and I can tell you f for certain that for our 18 to 24-year-olds in, in university, it is definitely the first time they've heard this. Um, but it's important for not only um, historical purposes, but just, you know, for self-confidence and to show people that, you know, in Iowa, we're not a bunch of hicks. We actually are sophisticated, we made a contribution to uh, uh, world culture, not just American culture, but world culture. And we're continuing to do that as well. So um, I think that there is a value to it, but I also think that it goes far beyond that. I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's like our Eiffel Tower or, you know, our Statue of Liberty. I mean, it is, it is the most famous painting in Iowa and, um, you know, it represents who we are. Uh, and remember, Jackson Pollock was 100% genetically Iowan. So. <laughs> Yeah. So on that note, um, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions in person. Thank you.